Hi, this is Rusty from Pickleball Channel. And what you're about to see can literally make the difference between life or death. We have heard story after story of how pickleball players' lives have been saved by fellow pickleball players or friends or neighbors who perform CPR or used an AED. Now, as you're about to see, this story is extremely close and personal to us. So we truly hope that you will be inspired to learn to do CPR so that lives can be saved and a difference can be made. Thank you very, very much for watching. I'm Rusty Howes, and as a lot of people might know watching this, I'm the executive producer of Pickleball Channel, but usually I'm not on this side of the camera being interviewed, I'm hosting or interviewing other people. There's a group of people that I play with in my community in Glendale, California, and we've become friends, and I just play whenever I can, and it's just, it's just fantastic. Uh, my name is Jerome Collins. I met Rusty, I was at the YMCA. Marshall Pura brought him up to the roof and he played pickleball with us and we've known each other two or three years. When I think of Rusty, I, I get emotional because we're, we're really close. I, I think of him as my brother because um, he saved my life and I'll never forget that. Because I'm busy, I don't get to play as much as I like. But on one particular Saturday, things changed last minute. And I talked to my wife, I said, oh, I think I'm gonna try to go play pickleball. I'm driving in my car, and I was just gonna go to where I always normally went. Um, but last minute, I thought, just popped into my head randomly. I'm like, hey, let me see where Jerome's playing at. Let me see if there's anybody playing at that other place that I've never been to. On May 29th, I woke up, got my stuff, and I walked to the pickleball court, and I started playing pickleball a few games. My name is Aida Badalian. I live in Glendale, and my hobby is playing pickleball. Jerome is a very friendly guy. He's like a comedian. We enjoy playing with him, and we like him very much. We tease him all the time. He teases us. We've been playing pickleball that morning. We started uh, around 9 o'clock, and uh, I think Jerome played about two games. Then he wanted to rest. Then he started collecting the balls. But while he was collecting the balls, he fell down. And that's basically all I remember. And then next thing I know, I look over and someone's saying something, yelling, and Jerome's lying on his back in the corner by the building. And you realize something's wrong. And I just ran over, and someone's yelling, call 911. And I get there, and he's gasping for air, and then, oh, he lets out his last breath. I was actually at the front counter, so one of the pickleball gentlemen kind of ran and said, there's a man fell down, he's unconscious, call 911. So as I'm calling 911, I'm with the operator and they said, we have the ambulance on their way. So I put down the phone and I ran outside and at that moment, Jerome was collapsed on the ground. So I just start doing CPR. I'm doing CPR, I'm doing a mouth to mouth and, then, and he comes back. And then all of a sudden, he goes out again. And we were all confused, we were all terrified, we were all panicking. And so I just start again and I'm, I'm pushing, I'm pushing and compressing and compressing and compressing and doing the whole thing and he doesn't come back and I keep going and it just seems like an eternity because he had, he had taken another breath before but now he's not. The only person who knew what to do during, uh, at the day of the incident was Rusty. It had been decades since I'd actually taken a CPR class. But I was all going back to decades ago classes that I'd taken. But you know what? That's him. That's Rusty anyhow. He's uh, a guy that likes to help people. And so it doesn't surprise me that he was right there, Johnny, on the spot when I fell down. He was the only one that knew CPR. And he just happened to be there that day. And then I just start working and working. And I'm thinking, are they coming? When are the firemen coming? And someone's like, they're on our way. My name's Captain Chris Jernigan. I'm the captain on engine 22 here at the Glendale Fire Department. We got a call for a person down at Pacific Park. Our engine was in the area, so we were the first to respond. Upon our arrival, we went and found Jerome, who was down in the corner there uh, in the park by the uh, building. And we saw, um, looked like a bystander um, that was doing CPR. And they take over, and I step back and I see them, and one person has a bag, and there's three people working on them at the same time, and they're checking him, and they inject him with some of the adrenaline or the epinephrine, and then they shock him with the AED, and, and then, then they're working on him again, and it doesn't seem to work, and then they do it again, and it doesn't seem to work. And we're all just kind of anxiously looking and seeing what's, what's gonna happen. Is is he gonna get, are we gonna get a heartbeat? A lot of things are happening at the exact same time because we only have a, a small amount of time to affect a change in that person. And there's this moment where I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's dead. 
but they're paying attention now and then all of a sudden they realize that they have a heartbeat, they have enough. So many times we go on these calls and the person's down and we find them without any CPR. And so what that does is it limits the amount of opportunity that we have to affect a positive change. I'm Dr. Jessica Sims. I've been practicing emergency medicine for over 15 years. Um, I work here now at Altamed as a regional medical director and I'm on the board of directors for the American Heart Association. Something like 350,000 people in the United States suffer from cardiac arrest each year. CPR generally doesn't reverse a cardiac arrest, but when the heart stops, no blood is moving and your brain needs blood moving all the time. It can only survive a few minutes without any blood circulating. So by doing CPR, you extend the period of time that the medical facility has to really get things moving again so that all the tissues can be perfused as they should be. In this case in particular, what we had was Rusty doing quality citizen CPR before we got there. That really opened up the window of opportunity for our guys to get in there and provide the more definitive care which resulted in the more positive outcome for Jerome. But he still was in critical, absolutely critical condition. So we get to the hospital, we transfer care over to the emergency room staff, because ultimately this patient's definitive care is gonna rest with the emergency room physician, who's then gonna hopefully diagnose the reason that patient went into full arrest. He had no local family, and it was just me at the time. And so while I was there, I'm calling everybody, and I'm trying to find something to do. I needed to find something to do, because I wanted to try to help. And then it got to a point where all I could do was wait. Wait and see if he lives, wait and see if he dies. The weird part of it is when I was a freshman in high school, one night my older brother got a phone call. He's on the phone and then he kind of goes quiet. And then he hangs up the phone, he looks at me, he says, I think dad might have had a heart attack. There's this moment in between when you know, but you don't know, right? And then the phone rings from something else. But everything becomes about that, right? You're just waiting. And um, my dad ended up dying. But I had kind of flashbacks to that with Jerome because he's in the hospital and every time my cell phone rang or every time something rang, I was expecting to hear, you know, is, that he's dead. Um, but I never got a call that said he's dead. I got a call that says he's, he's alive and his heart's beating. You know, it's, it's amazing on that day. You may call it divine intervention or not, but Rusty hardly comes to the Pacific that often. I mean, it's once in a while. But that day that he came, he was the only one that knew CPR. I was very lucky. I was lucky he was there. It was touch and go still for a little bit. He was kind of had some amnesia, but the pickleball community totally came in. They were visiting him, they were supporting him, and all these people, the doctors, the hospital, and the pickleball players made a difference in an amazing recovery. And every day, one of my pickleball players, they would come and they brought their families. You know, they bring you the usual fruit. And they, don't bring me flowers because I can't eat flowers. The pickleball community rallied around Jerome so nicely, like even at the hospital, they were asking us, who is this guy? Is, this a cel is he a celebrity? And we, we, we were saying, no, he's a celebrity between us. We play pickleball together and we are like a second family to him. When I went back to the park, after it happened, I was hesitant to go back. And I went to the corner and I remember I wanted to see the corner as, instead of a corner of death, I wanted it to be a corner of life. And I kind of went in and I kind of claimed that corner as, as instead of it being a place of darkness, you know, it's the beginning of this great thing happened, you know. He didn't die and he had a second chance on life and a whole new chapter can begin because of it. So now after a year later, we still see Jerome. He comes in, he's smiling, he's continuing to play. When I died, I got to see the other side. And so I can face life a little bit easier and not be afraid anymore. And now Jerome is still with us and playing with us and giving us hard time. You know, when people are saying like, you saved his life and you're a hero. And at first I was really uncomfortable with that. There's so many hands that were part of it. And it starts off with our bystander, Rusty, recognizing the situation and not being apprehensive and realizing this person needs help. Then the fire department comes in and does their part. And then the emergency room does their part, which is just as vital. And collectively with all those people involved is, is the reason we had such a positive outcome and Jerome was able to walk out of the hospital on his own power. That doesn't happen all the time. But when we get one of those types of situations, when we get someone to walk out on their own two feet, that's a big day, it lifts us up. But I didn't want to do this video at all. I was really hesitant and it's actually taken a year. The only reason I'm willing to do it is because somebody else somewhere in the country or the world 
from hearing about how much a difference CPR can mean the difference between life or death, we can make a difference. My name is Greg Fish. I'm the fire chief of the Glendale Fire Department. We have a saying in the fire service where time is tissue. And the reason why we have that saying is because after about five minutes, the human brain starts to break down because of lack of oxygen. And it's really important that the bystander take the initiative and uh, circulate that oxygen to the brain so that that brain does not die. We can't do that because we average about four minutes and 20 seconds from the time of dispatch to the time we arrive on scene. So it's really, really, really important that we get someone with bystander CPR to initiate that CPR, to initiate that circulation within the body so that when we do get on scene, we have a fighting chance. Most definitely CPR can save lives. Um, we saw it happen with, with Jerome. Everyone should learn CPR. Uh, it can save the life of someone you care about, someone who lives with you, or also a stranger, a bystander. Learning how to do CPR is one of the easiest things and one of the most impactful ways that you can help your fellow human beings. The science actually is in the favor of only hands-on. We don't really want you to put mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR. We really just need you to get involved with your hands only. In those 10 minutes, just taking 10 minutes out of your day to go learn hands-only CPR, you can have a tremendous impact on someone else's life. When Jerome collapsed, that was the most terrifying experience for me. It was an eye-opening day for me, and the first thing I did after the incident, I tried to find a place to take the training uh, for the CPR, and that's what I did. And within a week, I took a CPR training, and I'm gonna do it again this year just to refresh my memory. That day, Rusty did CPR on me, and he was my hero. But anybody can do CPR and anybody can be a hero.